Greetings, visitors, those of you joining us live via live stream, friends, members, members of the media, museum staff, management, and leadership. I would also like to take a moment to welcome a special group of young people from the YNPN, which stands for Young Nonprofit Professional Network of the Triangle. They met here earlier in a meetup group for, of about 50, and they've joined us because of, of their competency models, equity, diversity, and inclusion fall within those models, and this lecture tonight was a field trip of sorts for that organization. So visitors, please give yourselves a hand and thank you for being here. My name is Amelia Cowens Taylor, and I am the Assistant Head of Communications here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I'm also the Community and Programming Coordinator for Race, Are We So Different? I'm delighted to welcome you tonight to the last panel discussion in our speaker series for Race, Are We So Different? Tonight's panel discussion and town hall is called A Wrap on Race, and we'll discuss where we go from here. Tonight, you will hear from three dynamic scientists, an anthropologist, an epidemiologist, and a biologist and nanoengineer. They each have unique perspectives on race. And with the help of our moderator this evening, WRL's Greg Fischel, we will navigate through those perspectives and then take your questions at the end. First, let me acknowledge our sponsors because it is because of them that the museum is able to offer this fine exhibition, Race Are We So Different? They are as follows. Race is locally presented by the A.J. Fletcher Foundation with media sponsors, WRAL and Fox 50, as well as Radio One Raleigh, with funding from the Ford Foundation, the National Science Foundation. It is also presented by Duke Energy Foundation, City of Raleigh, Wells Fargo, Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, and additional programmatic support from BB&T, Burroughs Welcome Fund, the Duke University Center on Genomics, Race, Identity, and Difference, University of North Carolina System, the Paul Green Foundation, the North Carolina Humanities Council, the YMCA of the Triangle, and additional media support from UNC TV. It is that collective of sponsors that helped us to raise more than $330,000 to make sure not only admission into race was free, but all of the programming associated with it. And this event tonight is part of that, that menu of programming. I'd like to also especially acknowledge the Burroughs Welcome Fund and Alfred Mays, who is responsible for our speaker series tonight. Let's give our sponsors a hand. Just by a show of hands, how many in here have seen the exhibit? Awesome. How many of you all have seen it more than once? Awesome. How many of you all told someone about it? Oh, I love it. I wish you could see the view from up here. <laughs> well, thanks to you, we have got some amazing stats to share with you a little later because the impact of this exhibit has made a tremendous impact on this museum and what this museum means for our community. And it is because you all came out and you all went and talked about this exhibit and you all experienced this exhibit and possibly a cultural conversation after that we are successful. And we still have a lot more time to go. You have until October 22nd to experience Race Are We So Different? And we have rack cards out there if you all know of organizations or you work someplace that you can set a stack of these, take as many as you want on your way out the door. So thank you. Finally, let me introduce to you Dr. Emlyn Coster, Museum Director, whose leadership and tenacity helped to make race, are we so different, a reality. Emlyn. Thank you, Amelia, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, wonderful to see you all in filling this uh, auditorium. Um, I stand between uh, the introduction of uh, our eminent speakers and panel and our facilitator, and 
Amelia's introduction. I just wanted to add a couple of uh, additional thanks and a couple of contexts. Um, I'd like to firstly um, commend the American Anthropological Association who um, had the vision that it was high time that Americans have a deeper grasp of what this word race means. Um, they would uh, assemble the funding that you've heard about from the Ford Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and uh, select a visionary museum that would have the, the courage, frankly, at the time to take this on. And the result has been a very lengthy tour after here it goes to Chicago, but it's been on some 50 venues crisscrossing the United States and Canada uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, that makes it a, almost a record maker in the, the business of traveling exhibitions. Um, the other thing is they named it with a question, race colon, are we so different? That's also uh, virtually unique in the museum field. It's provocative. It gives the visitor a sense of what the purpose of this experience is going to be by posing a question rather than just state, making a statement. And, and also um, that it's uh, it stimulated museums as it has traveled to think uh, differently about their own staff, to engage in training that makes all of us who work in museums uh, that much more sensitive to the issues in the communities that surround us um, but also um, to, to attract innovative programming of the type that you've, uh, that you've been seeing, many of you, during this series. I, I secondly would like to commend the A.J. Fletcher Foundation because uh, about a month or so prior to the start of this exhibition, on April 22nd, uh, this exhibit was going to end on Labor Day. But we, uh, we realized that our summertime schedule was not going to allow many schools to be able to see it because it was overlapping with the summer period. So uh, I'd like to commend the A.J. Fletcher Foundation and Capital Broadcasting for the vision to continue the experience uh, for a full six months through to October 22nd. Uh, while so this is the last program of the series, the exhibit continues for another seven weeks and I hope that all the hands up and the hands that didn't go up will continue to see it, recommend it, uh, come again and again and, and advocate uh, for this. You might ask, uh, thirdly, um, why does this fit within the Museum of Natural Sciences? Maybe this strikes you as odd, uh, maybe it doesn't, maybe you're all here because it doesn't strike you as odd. But we know that uh, race is such a complex phenomenon of interpretation and, uh, and difficulty and misunderstood, but as you may know if you've seen the exhibition, it's fundamentally rooted in science, in the science of anthropology, and I'll let our esteemed speakers say more about that, but um, as, as, a, as a member of the animal world, <clears throat> we homo sapiens need to understand that uh, uh, we uh, came out of Africa about 100,000 years ago, and as the exhibit says, we've been moving and mixing ever since, and our DNA um, is remarkably, despite that amount of time, has stayed to the sameness of 99.5% of that we're all alike. And so there's much to understand about this and much to, to disassemble when it comes to the social constructs of race. So that's a little bit about that. I, um, we, we, the museum here, with our mission to illuminate the interdependence of nature and humanity, are driven uh, by these four rhetorical questions of what do we know, how do we know what's happening now, and how does the public participate? Uh, in many ways, the, this evening and the subject matter is, is a shining example of all those four questions and of the intersection between us as a, as a result of natural evolution uh, and uh, humanity, which uh, is such a predominant part of the, of the natural world. And so um, th this exhibit fits and this talk fits within that construct. Uh, we have been adding conversation to our menu of how we deliver the mission, and we've done that in particular with the vision of uh, Capital Broadcasting and WREL, uh, because as Einstein said, Einstein said uh, we don't make progress without asking new questions and pursuing the answers. And so that's a relentless journey. and. Uh, and to know, uh, as many of you do, Greg Fischel as the chief meteorologist of WREL, who uh, is very free to speak about his own journey of, of coming into science 
from stereotypes that uh, he had when he was younger. Uh, he's been a marvelous facilitator of United Nations Sustainable Development Goal town hall discussions we've had here on many of the goals within that, within that journey of the United Nations. And he's joined us several times in this journey of Race Are We So Different. Uh, it's a great honor to introduce uh, the museum's uh, dear colleague, uh, Greg Fischel. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage, please. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Nice to see a, see a full house here tonight. This is great. Um, I want to start off tonight, and this may surprise you, maybe it won't, uh, with a lighthearted story because the rest of what we're going to be talking about tonight is pretty darn serious. Uh, but I'm hoping to draw an analogy uh, through the use of this story, and so uh, I'll make this brief. Uh, in 2011, our youngest son, uh, Austin, transferred to uh, Athens Drive High School, and uh, he was in the band, and uh, I was sitting in the bleachers uh, for a Friday night football game, and one of the band parents turned to me and said, well, Greg, we have this fruit and nut sale that we raise money for the band, and we're going to kick it off on Monday, and we'd like you to be involved in a, in a, in a brief skit to help kick it off with the kids when they come to class Monday morning. And I said, brief skit? Sure, that sounds cool. And she said, well, we're, we're rehearsing. We have a rehearsal tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And I'm sitting there going, rehearsal? That sounds pretty formal for a simple little skit. And so I show up for this said rehearsal, and I'm handed a 20-page script. <laughs> and it has a solo singing part. <laughs> now, I've never sung solo in my life except in the shower, and thankfully nobody's heard that. Um, so... Uh, I went on ahead with it. I stressed more about that than anything I have ever done on television. But you know what? It got me out of my comfort zone, big time. And yes, it was stressful, and it was nerve-wracking at times. But in the end, that band parent created a monster, because every year since then, I've come up with a new song and new lyrics to kick off the fruit and nut sale. <laughs> so something good came out of that initially scary and stressful experience. And I'm hoping that's what happens tonight. And maybe it'll never get scary and stressful for any of us, but it might. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that's OK. Um, we've got three experts here tonight that are going to help us get through all of this. I may ask a stupid question at some point in time, and I beg your forgiveness if I do that. But I think we're all going to walk out of here in 90 minutes out of our comfort zone and having come out of that in better shape than we were than we came in. At least that's my hope. So I'm going to introduce each one of our speakers individually, and um, they will give a, a short presentation, and then when all three of them are done, I will join them and we'll have a little conversation here. So I'm going to start off with Dr. Joseph Graves, Jr. Uh, he is Associate Dean for Research and Professor of Biological Sciences in the Joint School of Nanosciences and Nanoengineering which is a collaboration between North Carolina A&T State University and UNC Greensboro. He is also a fellow with the American Association for the Advancement of Science and Biological Sciences. Dr. Graves? Thank you. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge um, my intrepid students who journeyed all the way here from Greensboro <laughs> to be with us tonight. Not that there was the fate of this overwhelming grade assignment that might have had something to do with why they're here. But, but for the less intrepid, we did give them an alternative assignment, which was probably even more daunting because they had to read one of Jake Hoffman's papers, <laughs> which explains why so many of our students are here tonight. <laughs> now, having said that, um, some of you are probably wondering, what the heck is a nanoengineer doing here speaking about concepts of race? Now, the truth to be told, and you probably should not let this get around, I am really not a nanoengineer. <laughs> I don't have a degree in engineering. And, and in fact, when I was first offered the job at the joint school, I said, Jim, I don't know anything about nano. But I came to do nano-related research based upon my prior training. And my prior training is in evolutionary biology. 
And in evolutionary biology, our core dictum is that nothing in biology makes sense save in the light of evolution. And so I have started an entirely new field of research in nanoengineering, which deals with how microbes evolve resistance to novel nanomaterials. And this is something that actually people never thought about until my evolutionary perspective was brought to bear on what could be an exceedingly crucial question in terms of the safety of these materials as they're being deployed. Now, as an evolutionary biologist, you might also ask, how did I come to this question of human biological variation and its relationship with socially defined race concepts? Now, I have to tell you, um, this is not something I wanted to do. Throughout my entire career as a pioneer in the field, however, my ethnicity and racial background were always an issue. During my master's program, I mean, literally, I thought that nigger was my middle name. And by the way, this university was in the north, not in the south. So after doing this work on the genetics of aging, a colleague from uh, the University of Cal State University Hayward called me up after the publication of a very important book in 1994. The book was entitled The Bell Curve, or The Importance of Class Structure, or Intelligence and Class Structure in American Social Life, written by Richard Herrnstein and Charles R. Murray. And the question they put to me was, are the genetics in this book okay? So after reading it, I found not surprisingly, that there was a whole bunch of nonsense that was trumped up and wrapped up with racial misconceptions. And after writing the first analysis on what was wrong with the genetics of the bell curve, and also what was wrong with the statistical analysis, the paper was entitled, uh, uh, okay, yeah, Race and IQ Revisited, Figures Never Lie, But Often Liars Figure. And so I dismantled their core premises, showed that their statistics were entirely wrong, but even though the science behind their claims was entirely wrong, many of you in the audience will remember that by Christmas time, they were selling the bell curve at the price club. There were flats of it. There were university presidents swearing up and down by the prescriptions of that book. There were Newsweek, Time, Fox News, you name it, all screaming up and down that we finally found the secret to the racial subordination of African Americans, and that's their inferior genes. And so throughout my career, I have been called over and over again, along with my esteemed colleagues here, to continue to demonstrate the fallacy of the claims made by the racialists and the racists who continually try to trot up pseudoscience in support of their social agenda. Thank you, Dr. Graves. Next up is uh, Dr. Jay Kaufman, who is a professor and Canada Research Chair in Health Disparities in the Department of Epidem Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health at McGill University. That's a mouthful. And adjunct professor, Department of Epidemiology, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Kaufman. Thank you. Great to be here back in North Carolina. Um, I'm an epidemiologist, so I study distribution of health and disease in human populations. Uh, we look at the incidence and prevalence of all kinds of diseases, uh, and causes of death and illness. Um, and a primary way that um, populations are described along with their race, uh, along with their uh, age and gender is their race. Um, it's a, an American tradition now that's filtered into the rest of the world as well. Uh, and so we have many, many medical publications now, biomedical publications that organize their results in terms of racial groups. Uh, and uh, while there are differences in risk of disease across those groups, my experience is that this variable gets a lot more attention than it deserves. 
Uh, it's um, maybe a fascination, uh, particularly of American authors, but since the United States generates such a large proportion of medical research around the world, this has become a worldwide fascination with continental ancestry in the way that Americans define it. So we have some categories now that are completely American inventions, like Hispanic as a category, that now are part of biomedical research around the world, even though it doesn't, it's a category that doesn't make sense uh, outside the United States, or maybe it doesn't even make sense inside the United States. No. Um, so uh, this, this is a, a, a variable that's used uh, reflexively in medical research and reporting medical results and reporting statistics about health and disease. Um, it's not defined in a consistent way across time and across space. Uh, so the, the census categories have changed over time, and there's some attention to that in the exhibit upstairs. Uh, so we have uh, physicians or medical researchers describing populations as black or white, uh, whereas in other countries they would have a different way of categorizing populations as black or white, and so you could change your categorization by going from one place to another. Uh, it doesn't seem scientifically reasonable to have this kind of arbitrariness as a way of dividing populations for the purpose of medical research. So uh, I, I'm interested in, in my own research in critiquing this system, this habit that we have of dividing people this way in this kind of cultural way. Um, but I, I don't want to underestimate the importance of this variable. Uh, the answer to this question about are we so different is yes, we are very different because of the existence of this very important social distinction that we make. We give people different opportunities for education. We give people different opportunities for access to medical care. We give people um, different neighborhoods that we allow them to live in. Uh, this does create a lot of difference between populations in their behaviors, their health behaviors, and the kinds of diseases that they get. The question I'm interested in as a scientist is, do we need to be so different? Is this necessary that these differences exist, or is this just an artifact, a consequence of the particular cultural habits that we have at this particular time, in this particular place, because of our particular history. Uh, the way that we divide people up, it leads to these differences. And uh, 50 years from now, if we decide to organize ourselves differently, then maybe we won't see these differences at all. And in fact, when we look at these groups uh, in different places, even different places in the United States or across different countries, we can see that these disparities that we, we observe are highly variable. They're highly mobile over time and over space. Uh, and that makes me think very strongly that it's not a necessary biologic condition that we differ as much as we do. Very good. Thank you. And last but not least is Dr. Yolanda Moses, and I was just thinking when I saw where she uh, traveled from that uh, you're similar to the eclipse that we experienced a week and a half ago. You went coast to coast. <laughs> that's, that's pretty impressive. We, we thank you for, for making that effort. Uh, past president of the American Anthropological Association, a chair of AAA's National Advisory Board on Race and Human Variation, and co-author of Race, Are We So Different? She is a professor of anthropology and associate vice chancellor for diversity, equity, and excellence at the University of California, Riverside. She is the chair and, uh, of, and national advisory board of the Race Project and co-director of Race Project Phase Two. Dr. Moses. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation to be here. And I, I think what I wanted to do was to quickly tell you why this exhibit exists, right? One of the things that happened during the, um, my presidency is that we wanted to talk as anthropologists about how can we enter the national conversation about race in a way that helps to deconstruct some of the ways people think about this idea that is uh, not uh, real in the biological world, but we built whole systems around that belief. And <clears throat> one of the reasons we thought it was important to do this is because we as anthropologists, particularly in the 19th century, are responsible for what is called race science, right? So we should be uh, some of the people that help to dismantle what we know in the 20th century and the 21st century to be true. So that was part of the motivation. Now, 
uh, <clears throat> because we are four field discipline, that is we have biological anthropologists, we have uh, cultural anthropologists, we have archeologists and linguistic linguists, the, bio the biological anthropologists and the cultural anthropologists got together and worked with 26 different disciplinary associations, including the American Medical Association, the American Genetic Association, uh, to the American Philosophical Association, all of those associations, and we brought people together and said, if we were to have a national conversation about what race is and what race is not, how would we do that? And what would we say? And so what we came up with were three different things which you see, and that is the idea of race. It's an idea, it's a historical idea. Human variation is the way that we explain why we look different. It's not about race, it's about the variations that humans have within the homo sapien um, uh, category. At, but where we scientists fell short was we didn't take that next step and say, what are the consequences of us believing that that idea is real? And so the part of the exhibit that's focused on the lived experience is about what happens when you believe that that is real. And so that gets into the disparities in health the disparities in education, the disparities in wealth, all of those things that are so entrenched in U.S. culture that it's going to take a, a, a reframing and a re-education of our young people to make that change. And the initial intent of the, of the project was to focus on young children and teachers. Because guess what? We assume that everybody else understood this. <laughs> So little did we know <laughs> that that was not the case. And it continue, we continue to be um, amazed at the, at the entrenchment of this idea, even in the face of data, that this is not the case. People still hold on to these ideas, these deeply seated ideas. So uh, I am always impressed to come to different uh, museums, and this has been a wonderful opportunity for me to see the programming, the wraparound programming. This exhibit has been to over 50 cities, and it's been seen by over a million people, millions of people use our website. And we're trying to think about what do we do next? Because it's not done, right? We're not finished here. There's more to do. So I'm very happy to be here and to talk about some of the things we've learned and are learning about uh, what this exhibit has meant in the places that it has, it has gone. And it's, in, it's enhancing our ability to think outside the box and to be uncomfortable. For example, we're learning as anthropologists that we have to think differently about how we frame even the research questions that we ask given the complexity of this issue. Thank you very much. Now, instead of admiring you all from a distance, I'm going to come over here and, and uh, have a conversation. And I, just based on what you said, and I promise not to get off on a tangent here, uh, but uh, I learned a year ago that I had been misusing the word belief for the first 59 years of my life. Uh, I met a climate scientist from Texas Tech, and she said that people ask her, does she believe in climate change? And she says, I don't believe in climate change. I accept it based on the evidence. Yeah. Correct. And I had never made that distinction before. So that, I think that speaks to what you were talking about. All three of you were kind enough to give me ideas for questions to ask each of you, which I <laughs> greatly appreciate. Um, I wanted to ask one general one, though, just uh, before that, and you know what it is, but the two of you don't. And, uh, and it, it's this, that uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I've been down here 36 years now. And I guess my general impression over the period from the 60s to now 
was that we had made great strides in the area of race relations, that we no longer had uh, blacks in the backs of buses and, and, and this type of thing. And then when the Charleston shootings occurred, I think for me that was the first time that I asked myself the question, maybe we haven't. Or was everything I thought that was progress for those 40 or 50 years, was it a mirage? Or is it simply saying that we've come a long way, but we've got a lot farther to go? So I'll start with, with you, Dr. Gray. Um, there are, um, let, let, let's start with the de jure or legal end of segregation. So due to great struggle, we were able to get laws which made it illegal to discriminate in housing and employment. But many would argue the thing that got Reverend King killed was when he went to Memphis to organize the sanitation workers for better wages and better work conditions. When he came out against the United States warfare against the people of Vietnam, those were things that began to challenge the institutions behind racism and discrimination. So when sociologists look objectively at the things that have happened in US society over this time period, there have been some areas in which you could say things have gotten better. But there are far more areas in which things either stagnated or, or got worse. So for example, if you look at things like unemployment, unemployment of African Americans has been historically twice that of European Americans. That hasn't changed. When you look at things like incarceration, incarceration rates have consistently increased. And now to give the audience a, a, a sense of, of how insane this is, um, during Jim Crow, when there were de jure laws which put people in jail based upon the color of their skin, the ratio of African Americans imprisoned at that time was 3.3 to 1 compared to European Americans. But today, in 2017, the ratio is 7.3 to 1. So over this in time period, the increase has been steadily occurring in mass incarceration. This also, by the way, has the effect of disenfranchising people in terms of being able to vote. It also leads to things like uh, power plays on the part of legislatures to gerrymander districts so people can't vote. It also influences the possibility of individuals to be able to get education, to be able to start businesses, to, in fact, have their own lives secured when they walk down the street. Even during the presidency of Barack Obama, African-American youth were being murdered on the streets of the United States. So while we might have had the appearance of things getting better, I think objectively, based upon things that we can measure, things, in fact, didn't change and in many ways got worse. Dr. Coffin? Uh, I, I can't disagree with uh, a lot of the specific points, but I, I do see a lot of important improvements at the same time. I mean, it's, it's, it's two steps forward, one step back. There are um, certainly challenges that continue to exist, but the, um, the basic statistics about life expectancy and, and disease rates have shown a, 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 an improvement for all racial groups in the United States, and that disparity between blacks and whites has steadily decreased over time. Uh, so the uh, life expectancy gap now is something four to five years uh, of life expectancy between blacks and whites born today. Um, but that is down by two years over the last um, 15 or 20 years. So if we continue at that rate, you know, within a generation, we'll come to parity. Uh, so there are some real improvements at the same time. I think the the, the political achievement of the end of segregation, segregated hospitals, segregated facilities like that, uh, that made such a huge difference in, in differential access that existed before. Um, I think some political achievements like that have been very meaningful and have really made a big difference. Um, but we still have huge differences now in access to medical insurance and things like that that we still have to solve. Is, is it fair to say that it's tough to legislate morality. It's tough to legislate what's in somebody's heart. You can pass laws and, and have them, force them to behave differently, but is it really in here? 
Um, <laughs> I answer that question. I, uh, you know, there were a lot of groups that suffered uh, discrimination in the past. You know, when the Irish and Italians arrived in the United States, they were the victims of tremendous discrimination and employment and educational opportunities. And that doesn't seem to be a normative response now. So over time, those kinds of feelings can change. Okay. Um, it's somewhat unique, actually, for African Americans that for a long period of time, they have remained a group that hasn't been integrated in the same way that immigrant groups have been integrated into the population and in, into the definition of what it means to be an undifferentiated American in this way. And this is an interesting anthropological or sociological or political question. What has prevented African Americans from becoming fully American in terms of that kind of acceptance? Um, but it, it ought to be possible. Yeah. 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 Do, you, do you remember the original question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I do. Okay. Um, one of the things that we have to remember is that these uh, laws, there, there was a, a civil war that was fought, and there were laws that came into existence, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, um, from the very beginning of this nation, and that's the point of the idea of race and the history of race in this country. You can't talk about the origins of the U.S. without talking about its relationship to race and how it has ca characterized people. So from the very beginning of our, our nation, even before we became independent of England, African Americans and Native Americans were three-fifths of the people in the law. They were three-fifths of people within the law. So if you hear something over and over and over again and you you are, you, from the time you grow up, these people are different, these people are different, these people are different. It's going to become a cultural phenomenon regardless of what you do with the laws. So what you had was, yes, we have the laws on the books and we have to pass the laws, but who enforced the laws? The laws had to be enforced. It took 10 years after Brown for the South to start desegregating the schools. We had the laws. So where was the institutional and the political and the social will of people to do that? And that's what we as anthropologists try to get at. What is it that's keeping us from seeing people as being just di different doesn't mean inferior. But it's in the warp and the woof of our, our nation, we have intentionally drum that into our laws and into our social practices for such a long time that unless we understand that, it's, and how, then we're not gonna understand how to undo it, which is why we did the exhibit the way we did it. Those, three, those things are all intertwined. So it isn't gonna be easy. And that was one of the reasons we wanted to start with kids, because <laughs> we figured there'd be a lot less for them to unlearn than the adults, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the other thing I wanted to talk about. I'm from California, and we're already a majority-minority state, which means white people are slightly less than 50%. And guess what? We haven't fallen into the sea. <laughs> we haven't become a place where you can't walk uh, you know, on the street, right? We're the, the eighth largest economy in the world. We have you know, a global sort of outlook. And young people have moved past these categories that we have set up. We have some of the most diverse um, uh, students, and they're marrying each other. They're having kids. So these categories are going to cease to have meaning at all. And we're still holding on to this. And so that's a part of what it is we're trying to see. We're a 21st century country that has some laws that have helped, but is changing the hearts and minds of people that we have to really do. The law's already there, but we've got to figure out how to not use the laws, but to do what is the right thing to do. For a country that started as a pluralistic country and is a democracy, a pluralistic democracy means we gotta figure out how to embrace difference and use that to our advantage.
So I'm going to reverse the order now and uh, stay with you. Um, you are one of the co-authors, or my co-author of this exhibit. And so it's been to over 50 different museums and science centers across the country. Uh, do you have any uh, evidence, data, whatever, that indicates that this exhibit has had a lasting impact on the people that have come to see it? Um, that's a great question. And first of all, uh, truth in advertising, this is going to be a one-off, right? When we did it, when we first conceptualized it, we said this would be a great public service that we can do, and then we can turn it and go back to our research, do that kind of thing. But what has happened is this has been the gift that has kept giving to us because there's a hunger, there's a, a need for teachers, for politicians. We've been called on consultations to talk to social workers in different states about how to deal with disparities in how children are placed in homes uh, by race. And that was never anything we thought we would be engaged in because there's still that kind of issue. So what we're learning is that culture, and we define culture as learned behavior in just you know shorthand, is so powerful, even in the face, as I said, of data that shows you shouldn't be doing certain things because you've been conditioned to do them. You have to sort of uncondition yourself. What assumptions are you bringing to the table as a social worker that under similar circumstances, this is in Texas, that you would take African American and Latino children out of homes that you wouldn't white children under the same circumstances? And these are social workers that have master's degrees, right? So they wanted to understand what was it they were holding on to that would not allow them to do that. So what we're learning is that while this is a good beginning, that there's a lot more we need to do in terms of research around this question of what is it that changes your mind. And so we, we want to focus more on brain research, on what is it about deeply held beliefs that won't let you let them go. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what we are really talking about here. In the, in the United States. So we're finding that out. So culture is very powerful, and we have to uh, do that. We're also finding that uh, teachers, and this is something that's really important, aren't being trained in their training in our universities to talk about these issues in the complex way that we're talking about here in, in the exhibit. That is, the biologists learn this, social studies teachers learn this, but do they te co-teach classes together where you can see how those things play with each other. So that uh, the teachers who we've come into contact with have said, we need more training. We need more bio, the social studies teachers need more understanding of human variation. And the um, biological folks say, it's OK for us to talk about this. It's not too political. We won't get in trouble. <laughs> so so there, there, there are those kinds of dichotomies for the, for, for the children. And <clears throat> People still need space to have these conversations. Because in the US, what people don't want to be called, white people don't want to be called as racist. And so it shuts down a lot of conversations. And part of the this design of this exhibit was to promote conversations among people and to give people a way to have these conversations and to ask questions. So that's what we're learning. And you know, there are some uh, people that have come to this exhibit have been encouraged to leave comments on cards. Yes. And a couple of, one that struck me was a uh, gentleman who said he had, uh, I think he was retired, and he said he had been an educator his entire life. And after going through this exhibit, he had come to the conclusion that he had failed his students. I thought that was very, very powerful. And then another interesting one, and Emily, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think uh, somebody shared this with me, that the majority of African-American folks that visited this exhibit thought it was appropriate for the entire family, and that a majority of the white visitors to the exhibit thought that it was not appropriate for kids. And I don't know if, you know, I'm not even going to speculate if that's reflected here tonight or not, uh, but, uh, but I, interesting disparity. Uh, well, it, 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 it's... It's also the narrative, the cultural narrative for the past 35 years in this country 
that we live in a colorblind society. That is the popular narrative, when in fact we don't and we never have. So if we really want that, we've got to think differently about how we move forward. Dr. Kaufman, uh, from a, a medical standpoint here, uh, the different racial groups have different risks of, di of disease, uh, such as uh, preterm birth, hypertension, sickle cell, all more prevalent uh, in blacks than in whites. Because of those differences, does medicine need to take race into account when it comes to screening and deciding on best treatments? Yeah, so the, the prevailing view in medical practice in the United States is yes, uh, that uh, because populations have different risks, that's important to know what population people are in. So we need to gather this information that the patient is black or white or, or some other race because that's going to make a difference in uh, what disease we might suspect them to have or what tests we should order, what medicines are going to work better for them. Uh, the argument about that is about the difference in the mean of different populations. You know, if the mean blood pressure of blacks is higher than whites, then you might uh, believe that you should give them a different medicine or a different dosage of medicine um, because that population has a different mean. Um, but the problem with that kind of thinking is that people in the population are not all at the mean. They're at whatever level they are uh, as individuals. The fact that they're from a population that has a higher or lower mean doesn't define their individual risk. Uh, so it's, a, it's an error in thinking that the mean determines um, the status, the best treatment for every individual. Um, suppose, it, suppose we accept that um, men on average are taller than women. Uh, then we might say, okay, so uh, the, the exit aisle of the airplane should be reserved for men because since men are taller than women, uh, and the exit aisle is for taller people, then we should always have that just be for men. And that would lead to the ridiculous practice that you might have a very tall woman and a very short man, but you would give the man the exit row. It doesn't make any sense for the individual to treat them be, uh, uh, as determined only by their mean. So it's exactly the same with decisions about treatments for racial groups. So uh, one example is that uh, for Measuring kidney function, we have a, um, uh, a, a measure that we calculate uh, called the Grimalio filtration rate, the GFR. Uh, and that formula is different for blacks and for whites. In, in medical practice in the United States now, the formula that's calculated from the measurements taken on the individual includes whether they're black or white. And it um, gives a higher kidney function to blacks at the same level for the other parameters in the function. Um, the argument for that, if you ask a physician, why is this GFR function different for blacks and whites, the argument that they'll give is because on average, blacks have more muscle mass. Therefore, uh, this formula is better calibrated to blacks if we make this adjustment. This leads to the same kind of abs absurd conclusion that we would make for the men and the women in the exit rows. That if we have a very muscular white man and a very lean, not muscular black man, that we would still make this correction in the GFR for the black man because the average black person supposedly has higher muscle mass. I don't even know if that is a true statement about the population. Yeah, yeah. But even if it were true, true but... it would not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Even if it were true, it would not justify the treatment of each individual according to that. And yet that is absolutely standard in medical practice now. Hmm. Uh, and there are many other examples like that in dosage of medication, mm -hmm. in, in other criteria that are race specific in medical practice. And then many, many other judgments that are made informally. So a physician might differentially diagnose something one way or another, not because the textbook says that this is the way black <laughs> people should be treated, but just because they have built up a certain belief over time in their practice that this is characteristic of black people, white people as they understand it. And so there's a lot of differential treatment in that way. So we have a lot of studies now, uh, experimental studies, where we blind the uh, doctor to the patient's race, or we experimentally manipulate the patient's race, and we can observe this discriminatory behavior. Some of it 
is, is very uh, is discriminatory in the sense that it puts black patients at a profound disadvantage. And we can observe this in experiments, that this is the way uh, medical systems treat patients. Um, some, some of that is a function of stereotypes, social stereotypes that exist. Um, stereotypes about behaviors or stereotypes about um, other disease risks. Um, but some of that is actually written into medical textbooks as the appropriate treatment. The exit row example almost reminded me of a colleague of mine that tried to prove that football caused winter because every time people started playing football, it started to get colder. Uh, <laughs> All right, uh, Dr. Graves, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm sort of going to combine these, these two ideas that you share with me, but, you know, we talked about 99% of the genome of all human beings being the same. Uh, so if there are no biological races based on that statistic, then how can DNA ancestry, ancestry tests work or do that? <laughs> okay, so first, uh, let me start by correctly explaining that statistic because there, there's a great deal of misconception about the 99.7% identity statistic. Um, when we start talking about population variation, we don't do it from the 99.7% that is shared by all human beings. That's basically the template for being a human being, so everybody has that. The analysis has to be in the 0.3% of the genome that isn't shared by everyone. So in the same way that if we were to move to our most closely related living species, chimpanzees, they share 98% of their genome with anatomically modern humans. And so if we were to use the 99.7, okay, that's what makes us us. 98% is what makes them them. So the difference is this 1.7, then the difference between the chimp and the human. So to understand population variation, we have to go into that 0.3. Now, now also be aware that we're talking about in the human genome 3.3 billion base pairs. Yeah. So then we multiply that by the 0.3, we're still talking about a couple of million base pairs that can differ between any two individuals in this audience. And so that's where we start doing the apportioning based upon the ancestry of people in various portions of the world. And guess what? 85% of that 0.3 is still shared by anybody in the world. So we're now getting to an even smaller amount that is localized by continent, maybe about 10% of that. And by region within continent, about 5%. So this is because we are a young species. And, and this is, again, something people have to wrap their minds around. Yeah. Anatomically modern humans is only about 150,000 years old. And for 100,000 or so of that years, everybody in this room's ancestors lived in East Africa. So it was a recent migration event out of Africa, which accounted for what is actually the small, tiny amount of genetic variation, which is exhibited in this room. People look at physical appearance and say, oh, there must be all this genetic variation because people have all these different physical features. Nonsense. We have about 5,000 coding genes in the human genome, and only five of them code for skin color. So people do the math. So what seems to be apparent biological diversity isn't. It's a few minor traits that are not correlated with each other. So if you look at skin color, you look at hair type, you look at body proportions, they're all not correlated with each other. And that's why we can't define biological races, either by physical traits or by genomic traits. Now, having said that, you've got this 0 0.0015 <laughs> of the genome, which is differentiated enough between the continents for people to attempt to try to do genetic ancestry testing. And if you have a population that has stayed in place for a long period of time, and you have very good measurements of like grandparents of these folks, you can probably localize using that section of the DNA people to that region. But we're not talking about 
you know, um, like, for example, Leipzig versus um, Prague. We're talking about yeah. Central Europe. Yeah. Okay? So that works for populations that fall in that category. Now, one of the things that I've consistently pointed out is that for persons of West African descent, particularly the people we call African Americans, whose ancestors were, were derived from a region that saw a great social cataclysm in the form of the transatlantic slave trade. Looking at populations that are there today in various regions is no indication that those people were there at the time of the transatlantic slave trade. In addition, even if they were there at the time of the transatlantic slave trade, so many people were taken away that genetic markers that are in that region now are in no way reflective of what they would have been 250 to 300 years ago. And so when you attempt to do genetic ancestry testing on African Americans, you're really, really stretching it. And so even though I, I'm involved in trying to teach genetics and genealogy as part of the curriculum to help understand these processes, you know, most of us who do serious genetics consider genetic ancestry testing as basically recreational genetics. <laughs> and, and I said so to um, Ancestry.com's population geneticist expert when we were interviewed on Al Jazeera, and I, and I basically said, yeah, your work is basically, you know, recreational. She got all flustered. <laughs> and then I said, well, okay, if it's not so recreational, would you mind sharing with me your DNA marker panel. And then she got quiet. <laughs> and then I asked, well, would you mind sharing with me the genetic algorithms that you use to make these predictions? And then she got even more quiet. Wow. So the bottom line is you have an industry that has no regulation. In other words, scientists who do human genetics, we can't see how they come to their conclusions about how they're saying that these markers make you this, that, or the other. Now, in standard, you know, peer-reviewed science, we say that that's nonsense. You, you can't do that. But this is an entire industry that's grown up in secrecy. And so, quite frankly, I don't recommend that anybody do their DNA and pay money for this. And, and you know, I use it as a teaching tool, but I, I would never pay money for that. Never. So what can I spend that money on next month? <laughs> <laughs> Another point about that is not only is there, not only is the algorithm secret, but you can never look at the gold standard, the true answer. Like if they say you're 15% this and you're 5% that, how are you ever going to know that you're not? Like there's no, you can't like, you know, open you up and look and say, oh, you got that right or you got that wrong. There's no, there's no gold standard. But, 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 but it does, but, but it does speak to the desire or the need for people to want to have an identity, to want to know where they came from, and try to understand who they are. And so I think by doing what you're doing, you're giving, you're educating people on how to do it, right? But let, let me be more clear on this, because All right. this, this, is also, All right. this is also one of these just insidious beliefs that people have about DNA. Yeah. How exactly does a particular genomic variant make me who I am. Half of the human genome is expressed in the brain. So how does any particular one make me who I am? And so, you know, people have television shows where they take celebrities back to Africa and say, you know, your people are really musical, so I guess that's why you're a musician today. I mean, that's literally been said on PBS. <laughs> so. So the difficulty here is this notion that the genes encode characteristics yes. Yes. in ways that they simply don't. Okay? And so having a genetic marker that says that you share ancestry with like half of the people on the western coast of Africa doesn't really tell me much about who I am. Right. Okay? I already knew that from the historical narratives of the transatlantic slave trade. I know that I had ancestors that were somewhere in the west coast of Africa. I know that I have ancestors that came from somewhere in Europe, okay? And those genes contributed to 
the person that's sitting in front of you. But the person that's sitting in front of you is, was never determined by those genes. It was determined by his experience living, quite frankly, in a racist society. That's what made me me. Not, not the genetic markers that I got from this, that, or other people from Scotland or uh, Zambia. So that's the lived yeah. experience. Yes. Right, right. Can, can I say one thing sure. about skin color? Uh, one of the points we try to make in the exhibit is that skin color is the, 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 is culturally constructed. That is, we could have used other markers to enslave people if that's what we were going to do in this country. But we use skin color. And so we gave it the meaning that it has. It's nowhere other than in our social construction. And the question that we ask as anthropologists is, what, why was it important to do that? And, and why is it important for it to continue? And what can we do as educated folks to push back against our, our identities being in our skin color. Now, Professor Moses, I am really glad, glad you asked that question because there's actually a whole group of students over there who could answer that because <laughs> that was actually one of the slides we showed in today's class. So, so Jacob, would, would you mind standing up and, and helping Professor Moses with that question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> so do it, man. No, I didn't hear the question. Oh, so, so you didn't hear the question. So, so remember the slide we showed today about the, the moral or the immoral logic of the transatlantic slave trade? Oh, okay. Mm. All right. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the immorality behind it is the reason Europeans did it, most of the time we think it's because they hated African Americans. And that's not true. They did it because there was so much wealth in the New World and what they thought was Asia. There was so much wealth there, so much opportunity. They needed people. But the kings there, they're not going to give away their peasants. No, no, they're working their land. They're making them money over there. So they're going to keep them there. So they're like, hmm, how do, I get, how do I get workers there, cheap workers, cheap labor, without losing any of my labor here? So they're thinking, well, why not use the Native Americans or Native people of those areas? Well, when the Europeans came, they brought diseases that would, you know, kill or wipe them out, or some people like Columbus would just commit genocide. So what they did is, since they had already been in Africa through uh, trade, uh, many African Africans would have uh, resistance to some of those diseases. So they would take those, and they would take them, and they, that's why they used uh, slaves. And it wasn't for any mal malicious reasons, though it would be later. It was more for economic gain, if anything else. Very good. All right. And, and we didn't rehearse that. We, that. we really did. I could tell. I could tell. <laughs> Questions from the, uh, the audience down here? All right, there we go. There we go. Thank you for this great presentation. <laughs> Thank you for this great presentation. I'm very curious around trauma. And I know you know of Dr. Joy DeGruy about the post-traumatic slave syndrome as in what has been passed. Anyone want to take that? Um, do, are you addressing? Oh, syndrome yeah. And the impact of it today. Um, could, could I just back, back up a couple of steps and say that in that we have anthropologists who have studied um, high blood pressure in uh, slave in the um, African American population today, and comparing it to high blood pressure in. Um, uh, folks in West Africa, and there are all kinds of theories about uh, the impact of, of slavery, but 
there is no one body of evidence evidence to be clear about that because in, in and I don't know about other fields but we're just starting to look at triggers like post traumatic stress and and trauma in the in the body as recurring things in people who live under oppressive conditions over long periods of time and this is research that is beginning to happen, we need a lot more of it, but we're seeing it in other populations also here in the U.S. <coughs> who have lived under stress, returning people from the military. Uh, but when you look at those syndromes and you compare it to African Americans who've been living in oppressive conditions over a long time, you see very similar kinds of conditions. So to your point, what is the impact of this over time? Does that help to produce some of the health disparities? that National Institutes of Health and other places can't get at. Why are we continuing to see these disparities when we're giving resources and money? So I would say this is an area that is wide open for research. I don't know the particular uh, person that you named, but if it's been denied so long in social science, I don't know about medicine, that there's a link between the behavior of groups and how they've been systematically treated under oppressive systems. Because in this society, we focus on individual responsibility, not systemic racism and what happens over long periods of time when you live under those conditions. And so that's what we're trying to show in this exhibit, that there have been people living under those conditions for hundreds of years. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a, quite a bit of epidemiology now about uh, intergenerational Good. effects. You know, if, if you have a mom who's um, uh, denied adequate nutrition or adequate uh, 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 access to other aspects of, of healthy life, uh, she's going to pass those disadvantages on to her children because the prenatal environment is not as rich as it would have been if she had access to, to a healthy environment. Uh, things like prenatal stress and things like that also have effect on, on outcomes. We see this uh, intergenerational effect in uh, when we study cohorts, uh, like there's a, a Dutch famine cohort of people who are exposed to famine during World War II, and we see in the children of those people exposed to famine as well, this intergenerational effect. Um, it was Joe Graves, actually, who told me once that he did research on fruit flies, and that if you deprive fruit flies or you put them in adverse conditions, it takes many generations before they are as healthy as the fruit flies that were not deprived. Um, so it takes a long time for those kinds of effects to wash out after you've, uh, after you've abused uh, a population. Yeah, and, and one other point that needs to be made is, you know, implicit in this conversation is that s suddenly conditions got better for yeah. African Americans, which they haven't. So when we look at the sources of environmental exposures that are associated with risk for complex disease, they're still there. So... Uh, I think it's uh, the, the percentage of African Americans who live within one kilometer of a toxic waste site is six times that of European Americans. So the percentage of African Americans who live in toxic air um, environments is three to four times that of European Americans. So, so it's not just intergenerational, it is right now African Americans live in a toxic environment compared to European Americans. So we don't even have to look to epigenetics because there are direct environmental insults that are continuing right now. Um, I just have a short story I'd like to uh, share that I think fits well in here, particularly with your interest in beginning some of these discussions with uh, children. Uh, there's a family in Raleigh, uh, a, a husband and wife who have two natural children, and then they have a seven-year-old African-American that they adopted many years ago and then they have an Asian daughter. So it's a blended family of a lot of different cultural backgrounds. And um, after the Charlottesville event, they sat down with their family to talk about what had happened in Charlottesville. And in this discussion, they talked about hate and you know, was being the reason because one of the kids had asked about that. And then they said to the African-American um, son, you may have some difficulty with the way you're treated 
as you grow up based on the fact that you're black. And she, they went on with their discussion and he said, wait a minute, you mean I'm black? He never realized it. How seven old years you? old. Oh, seven. And I think that's just an amazing story of the purity of how we think until we're screwed up. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so. You're, you're um, yeah, yeah. I, and, and thank you for, for sharing that. And I think that goes to the, the uh, notion that we believe as liberal people that we can raise our children in a colorblind way and that that's the ideal, that's the aspiration. The reality is that even if he doesn't think he is, society is going to treat him as an African-American male. And what he needs to do is to understand why that is. I mean, and you, there are ways to do it at seven, but you do it in a more, you know, you ease into it. <laughs> because it's hard to tell your children that we live in a racist society where we, we treat people differently on the basis of the color of their skin, which as we've been talking about here, is not even who we are, not even what makes us human. But we've taken that and we've used that in a yeah. way. And, and there's also uh, a great deal of scholarly study on the fates of African American children who are adopted into European American families. And the trauma that these children go through, and it usually begins at puberty. So you, you have uh, you know, narratives of children growing up and thinking everything was fine, everyone treated me okay, but particularly for African-American males at puberty, what many of these families have experienced is that neighbors who were their neighbors and buddies and friends go to church with them, et cetera, suddenly ostracize them. And um, you know, the racism against their family and against their son became exponentially worse as he was capable of dating their neighbor's children. <laughs> and so this is something that, 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 that people who, who you know, study this and also people who, who have done this you know, understand that it's really important for these children for them to understand the dynamics of racism in this country because you're essentially leaving a child defenseless if you don't. Hi, my name is Lindsay, and I'm actually a leader with um, a nonprofit, a local chapter of Results, and we use advocacy to fight inequality and work on solutions for poverty. Um, and because of that, um, seeking awareness and solutions for these issues, I'm aware of systemic res racism, the damage of employment discrimination, and less income and access to care, the criminal justice dis criminal justice system perpetuating um, less income, employment discrimination, and access to care, health care and education, and then restricted voting, voting and gerrymandering gives people less of a voice, um, and greater disparities because of those issues. But what um, I heard the most, what shocked me, was the health care analysis that we must not be at a roadblock because of health stereotypes and um, wrong assumptions. and even physician ignorance of DNA and body mass and um, those assumptions based upon race. I mean, it's one thing that my needs are different because I'm a woman than they are because of someone who's a man, but for racial health care blocks like that, I, I mean, that's just not right. How do we, how do we solve that? I like solutions. <laughs> I like to dig, in, <laughs> dig into the problem and what's the solution because that's just, that's astonishing. My mind is blown. <laughs> Uh, mine too. Uh, <laughs> and mine has been blown for a long time. Yeah, you go yeah. first. Yeah, me too. I, I mean, if I knew how, I knew the answer of how to solve that, I I would have solved it. So I I don't know that I um, can give you a very satisfying answer. I mean, we we have a lot of educational outreach that we make. Write a lot of critical articles. We try to talk to physicians. We do experiments in which we try to demonstrate this kind of behavior, um, but. In, even in, with the existence of all this evidence about the fact that the system is really a mess right now, there's not a lot of pressure on physicians to behave differently. Um, 
so I, I don't know how you build an incentive structure to get people to practice medicine differently. I, I do think that in the same way that Yolanda was talking about uh, making an effort here with this exhibit on kids to, to raise up a new generation that is educated about these issues in a better way, that an important intervention there is medical school, the way that we, the way that we train physicians. Uh, but there have been studies done about the attitudes of medical students and, and these things, these beliefs, strange beliefs about different racial uh, um, uh, predispositions to disease and, and uh, essential characteristics of racial groups um, seem to be present uh, even among medical students when they arrive at medical school. So even by the time they get to medical school, it may be too late. Uh, but uh, to the extent that we see things in textbooks and medical textbooks and in journal articles that are wrong or that are not evidence-based, we need to, to correct those things aggressively. Yeah, can I uh, make uh, two statements about this? Um, first, I mean, there is a real effort to try to reform the medical curriculum about hum human biological variation. And in that regard, I am one of the founding members of the International Society for Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health. And, and our goal is to help infuse into the medical curriculum evolutionary reasoning about humans and how they operate. Now, now we've had some amount of success getting to people who can influence the medical curriculum in this way. So, I, I mean, I've literally sat in a room with the deans of Harvard and Yale Medical School along with the head of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And, and one of the uh, uh, leaders of Duke's uh, medical school was there as well. So we've, we've had these conversations, but everything that, that Dr. Kaufman has said is still there in terms of roadblocks, in terms of winning the hearts and minds of, of medical students. So this is where, you know, I have to, again, you know, excuse the other members of the panel, because I'm going to say stuff that's probably going to get some people really upset right now. <laughs> but I, I need to say it. say it. So long as we view medicine as a profit-generating industry, Mm. We are going to continue to have these problems. And so until we as a society believe that health care is a fundamental human right, and we change the idea of how we build a medical workforce. So right now, there are very powerful vested interests who keep the gates of medical schools closed so that they can continue to command these high salaries because there are so few of them. And that is absolute, utter nonsense. As a professor who's been teaching in higher education for 30 years, I have seen literally thousands of my students who were qualified to enter medical training but who couldn't enter medical training because the gates are shut. And there was absolutely no reason to have these gates shut. And if we had a sufficiently large medical force, we could make health care affordable and we can make it a human right instead of a guild system based upon medieval thinking. Yeah. Can I, can I please to yes. that? I'd like to give you one more example of an experiment that we're trying in California. Um, I'm at the University of California, Riverside, and uh, about four years ago we started a medical school. Now, we were fought by UCLA, by Berkeley, by all the other UCs that had medical school. But the reason we got funded is because it's a medical school that's focused on a different kind of curriculum. And we have cultural anthropologists, social scientists that are involved with the, with the teaching. And we are focused on serving underserved populations. So if you come to the school, that's what you're coming for to serve underserved populations in California. And the state legislature w wanted to, to, you know, to fund that. So that means the curriculum is different. The way to get in is different because the, the hurdles you have to pass is, are different. It's what are you going to be contributing to helping these populations that are underserved and whose medical needs are underserved. So it's a different kind of model. And if we could have more of those kinds of models where the questions of what it means to be a doctor and the values around that are, are different, then I think we can begin to change that. And those of you who are in um, <clears throat> the professor's class here, 
can be that change, can be that next generation, oh, um, right? What? I mean, am I looking at you four over there? Okay, those maximizing access to research career students that Dr. Moses is talking to. And, just, just saying, guys. Yeah. And, and one, one more example I want to give, and this has to do when the exhibit was at the Natural Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian who didn't want the exhibit at first because it would be too controversial. But um, Francis Collins, who was then the, pre the president of the National Institute of Health, had us close down the exhibit one evening and brought 350 research students from NIH to walk through the exhibit and to have a conversation about how this information would help them think differently about the research that they, that they were funding because they had never been exposed to that kind of research, I mean, that kind of information before about what causes disparities, right? It's not just about the, the, what's in the body, it's about the environment and social structures that help produce uh, stress and trauma and illness. I have to ask a, uh... A question, I know we're getting a little bit late on time here, but, and I asked this question uh, uh, of somebody uh, that was very involved in this exhibit recently, and I had my eyes open, but I feel like I need to ask it because I think there have to be people in the audience, either here or through the internet, that have asked this before. If, if the goal is to have a society where we're not focused on skin pigment, you know, that we all want to be treated equally and, and accepted in that way and treated fairly. What is the importance then of having a Black History Month, a Black Cultural Center? Again, I asked this question recently and I had my eyes open, but I thought it was a question that I needed to ask tonight. I'll go first. Um, <laughs> Everything that you know we've talked about is trying to let you see that there's a reason we're, we have racial hierarchies in the United States. And that means that some people are, have been privileged by this system and other people have not. And in that privilege, the privilege to be the leader, the privilege to be the president. How many of you saw that panel of all the presidents of the United States and Barack Obama over there in the corner? <laughs> Well, it's like, okay, how do we benef how do we keep the US for the for white people in power? And it's very clear that policies and practices have been put in place to do that. Not all white people, because you're seeing the populist movements of working class white folks who are saying, wait a minute, we've been left behind here. Where 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 are we in all of this? But the bottom line is people have been marginalized. People of color have been marginalized. So Black History Month was an opportunity to say, wait, we have history too. Uh, Native Americans, Hispanic, everybody who has a week now or a month <laughs> is because they've been excluded from the meta narrative of the United States. And you can see the same thing with Black Lives Matter. The criticism of Black Lives Matter is, well, all lives matter. Yes, of course, all lives matter, but black people have not felt that the rest of society believe that. Mm -hmm. So they're bringing it to your attention. We're Americans, too. And we help build this country, too. And the toil and sweat, you know, everything we see here in, the, in this country is built by a multitude of people who've been silent and voiceless and left out. So these are ways, I call them compensatory ways to be a part of America. So if it had started out that we were all inclusive, we wouldn't have to have Black History Month. Yeah. And, and all those sort of add-ons or re-correcting history or even just having history. I mean, I didn't learn about the genocide of Native Americans in California until I was in graduate school. That was not taught in our eighth grade California history class, but it happened. 
So. Yeah, just underscoring what Dr. Moses said, African American history is American, American history. history. Mm -hmm. right. And without it, you simply cannot understand the social dynamics that we currently live in. So it's a remedial month. And, it, and as she said, if we were teaching history properly to begin with, there never would have been a need. Okay. Anything to add? No, it's okay. exactly that. Like, okay. I hope someday there will not be an African American History Month. Right. Break. So do I. Excellent. Um, my name's Connor. I'm with the University Scholars Program from NC State down the road today. And being from NC State, naturally, I have a lot of interest kind of in the technological side of everything. And in, the, in this instance, I got a medical question. And that, that is, given the tendency for certain physicians to perhaps prescribe different dosages to different people based on no data, but knowing that there are in some ways differences based on genetic variation within people, in what way do, do you all know of has IBM Watson been able to address that issue of, of, of that? Um, okay. Well, I, 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 I have field, to but. take that one on because you know, my, my research is also computational research. And, you know, machines aren't precisely that, machines. Um, it has a question of who writes the algorithms. Right. And so if you have an algorithm that's garbage and you put it on Watson, guess what? Watson gives you really detailed garbage. <laughs> so, so this whole, you know, notion about genomic variation in humans and, and health disparities, I, I've, I've written probably about... 30 papers on this and two books. And in them, I point out um, something called the myth of the genetically sick African. So when you look at the health disparity profiles of people of African descent in North America, you see that, uh, you know, if we look at 28 sources of biological disease, African Americans lead in 24 of them. So how do you come, how do you make sense of this, this, this profile? Well, historically, the way people made sense of this profile is by, oh, yeah, is, we, we, we measure um, and sequence African genes, and we find that there's a variant that's different from the European one. And since there's this profile of 24 diseases that African Americans have more than, than Europeans, it must be due to this variant that's the African one, hence the genetically sick African. Um, problem with this is that when I actually went through the literature, particularly related to hypertension, and looked at which genetic variants are considered to be protective variants and which ones are considered to be risk variants, turns out that people of African descent have higher frequencies of the protective variants, not the risk variants. But this doesn't seem to make its way into biomedical research because the assumption is that there's this genetically sick African. I mean, you were in Africa, you were fine, and then you got over to America and you got sick. It, it just happened like that. So it's not that if you understand genomics, you understand how phenotypes are produced, that there are basically four sources that produce a phenotype. There's the gene, there's the environment, um, there's chance events, okay, and also gene by environment interaction. And so when you put those things together for African Americans, they have the toxic environment and toxic gene by environment interactions, and these is, this is what produces this pattern of 24 to 4. In addition, if you understand that disease phenotypes are actually complex phenotypes with contributions of the entire genome, you could look at the genomes of Africans and Europeans, you could ask the question, well, who has the worst genome? And it turns out that we've done that. And guess who has the worst genome with regard to substitutions that have deleterious effects? It's Europeans, yeah. not Africans. Yeah. So if we were just going to make a prediction on the basis of what the genome says, it should be the Europeans with the 24 and the Africans with the four. But it's the exact opposite. So Watson's a great platform, but until you have scientists who understand this question, wouldn't help. I have been ordered uh, to uh, close this off uh, with a heart. Having so much fun. Now. I know, I know. We're just getting started. Yeah, uh, a heart out at 8:30, and I think it's like 8:29 and a half right now. Uh, so uh, I, I hope this was at least, you know, a starting point tonight uh, for many of you. Maybe a continuing point if you've already been involved in these discussions. Thank you, the three of you, so much for 
taking time to be here tonight. And uh, well, uh, your your applause and your presence uh, speaks loudly about the importance of this dialogue. And and uh, we at the Museum of Natural Sciences uh, have had a profound uh, summertime in in being exposed to the kind of caliber of dialogue that you've had this evening. And uh, there are many moments, uh, and I'll just uh, end by recalling two, uh, one of which um, is with my colleague Sh uh, Charmaine Royal from Duke University, who came with me to the Wake County uh, Raleigh chapter of the Human Resource Society to bring a different kind of cultural sensitivity training to, to 100 HR and organizational development officers at their July meeting and they had no idea what to expect and they came away saying this was the most profound sort of exposure to sort of the kind of training which is so common in workplaces but which had never been like this. So thank you, Charmaine. <laughs> calculations that would get John Glenn into space in, in the four orbit, orbits in 62 when there was a space race and, uh, and that evening we had the outgoing president of Shaw University uh, uh, who was here before she left for Howard University and the auditorium that evening was 96% uh, non-white and mothers and daughters were there to learn about how there should be no hidden figures when it comes to access research and scientific opportunities. So here, here. all of the yeah. experiences that we've been treated to, and especially this evening for this outstanding panel and this very profound conversation, please give your evaluations at some moments as you enjoy coffee and cookie outside. Uh, courtesy of the Friends of the Museum, and thanks for being with us this evening. Thank you. Uh, ask you how the drawing is correct now. Yeah. You, were, you were talking about how the Again, everyone, if you all would please take some race brochures upon your exit. Take them to your workplaces, your churches. Yes, yes. Take them everywhere. Take them, take them, take them, and spread the word about race. Thank you. I realized that my views were being hit.